Now, with new political events opening and closing in the last seven days, let's book, look back at the week that was here in Nigeria. And we begin with the arrest in Finland of the controversial secessionist leader Simon Epper, who allegedly used social media to incite violence in the southeast. The region has seen deadly attacks on both civilians and security agents, which the Nigerian authorities blame him for, but which he has denied, saying they they were carried out by the Nigerian government. And with me to examine this issue and all the other topics that we have on the program today are Mahmoud Jega, who is an Arise News analyst and former chairman of the editorial board of Daily Trust newspaper, Chima Christian, who is a public policy analyst and executive director of Africa's Morning Center for Public Policy and Good Governance. And uh, both Mahmoud and Chima are in the studio here with me. And in Lagos, uh, we are joined by Kenny Okolubo from uh, Arise Studios there. Kenny is a current affairs analyst, a political and communications consultant, and a former commissioner in Delta State. Right. Thank you very much indeed. And I've just been told that I would need to start with the guest in Lagos. I'm not entirely sure why. But let me come to you first, um, uh, Kenny Okolubo. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm usually used to you sort of sitting here with me in the studio. So it's a bit of a <laughs> throwaway having you miles away. I mean, you know, sort of in Lagos, but I that's know. okay. The, the power of technology unites all of us. Um, let, me, let me ask you this uh, about Simon Epper, because he had the threat of violence hanging over the southeast uh, with people there bracing themselves whenever he spoke. So beyond the Nigerian government, one expects that a lot of people in the southeast are breathing a sigh of relief following his arrest. Oh yes, uh, Simon Ekpa was more of a megalomaniac, if you ask me, in my own opinion. The, uh, the fact about Simon Ekpa was, he was a creation also of the Nigerian government, if you ask me, in my own personal opinion. Because after Namdi Kanu was brought back from Kenya and he was incarcerated, that gave rise to Simon Ekpa. And they, Simon Ekpa would never have a reason if... Uh, and Amdekanu had not been kept for this long. He doesn't cut across to us, or me particularly, as one who, who thinks about self-determination. He's more of a, a, a man that believes in violence, took advantage of the situation uh, he found himself because uh, Namdekanu had been incarcerated. And for some reason, he was able to get sit at home on Mondays, just because people were calling for the release of Nam de Kano. And that's why for some of us, we thought releasing Nam de Kano would have caught the powers of the likes of Simon Ekpa, who will sit in Finland, very far away from home, given instructions. Uh, those instructions are being adhered to. People were actually being killed on his instructions. And you know, the funny thing about it was that conventions were actually also held in Finland. He has his followership, no doubt, because he's been able to build a cult around himself. If you notice on social media, there's this lady called Ngozi who, call, who styles herself as, as his chief of staff, who has called on them to continue with the agitation for the independence of uh, uh, Biafra on the 2nd of December, and gives this false impression that even with the arrest of Simon Ekwa, they can go on in declaring a Biafran republic on the 2nd of December. I think intelligence that is a, uh, the NIA, has not done well in this sense. Because though we don't have an, a, an ambassador in Finland, there should have been an interface, sort of, before now. And even now that he's been arrested, I heard the chief of defense staff saying that he, he will be extradited to Nigeria. There's no extradition treaty between Nigeria and Finland. So what I expect Nigeria to do at this point is to make sure not, they shouldn't be monitoring his trial. They should have representation from the office of the attorney general actually go to Finland and make representation in monitoring, in not monitoring the trial, but being in the actual process of trial. Okay. Well, let, let me come to you, uh, Mahmoud Jege, because I'm told that our comms are well established now. 
and uh, it's good to see you again. Um, I mean, like Simon Etba's growing influence was, was such that he had started imposing a sit-at-home order um, from Finland on the southeast and, and threatening to use violence and intimidation to prevent the 2023 presidential election from taking place in the southeast. And this forced the Nigerian security agencies to massively deploy in force um, in the southeast. And that's how they managed to diffuse that situation. But with his arrest, we're not really sure how his foot soldiers will react, are we? Can the southeast throw off the shackles that he and his supporters tried to force on the people? Or is it likely to continue in your assessment? Mahmoud Jager. Oh, I see. Well, uh, <laughs> certainly it is a very interesting uh, development because uh, Nigeria as a whole, and uh, particularly the Southeast region, has suffered uh, for many years through the inciting activities of uh, people allegedly campaigning for the actualization of uh, the sovereign state of Biafra, as they call it. And uh, this man, Simon Epa, so far away in Finland, and he capitalized on the detention and trial of uh, Namdi Kanu, the IPOB leader, and has been saying all kinds of things grounding uh, this, this sit-at-home order. It's a very terrible thing that happens to a region like the Southeast, where commerce is the main uh, activity uh, of life. So. Whether he gets extradited or not, he had tested to the limit the liberal atmosphere mm. in the Scandinavian countries because, I mean, he chose his residence very carefully. The Scandinavians are extremely liberal, but even them will not be happy to see violence being encouraged in any part of the world because if for anything, if 220 million of us in Nigeria scatter, uh, at least half will go to Europe and some will be in Finland. So they should not be very happy about that. And uh, if the Nigerian authorities really rise up and uh, make an appearance in the Finnish uh, judicial system with all the evidence to show the havoc that his posts on social media have been creating in Nigeria, then they could uh, very well get him convicted and incarcerated and at best uh, silence. Now what you cannot prevent is another person uh, trying to step mm, into mm. the void and do the same thing. But we cross that bridge when we get to it. Well, that's actually a very good point because I, I think um, Kenny also raised this issue and that is that you could argue that uh, Nandi Kanu's continued detention has meant that IPOB no longer operates as a coherent force without I mean, with a clear command structure and a clear political program. And that is what has helped to throw up um, more extreme factions led by the likes of Simon Etba. I wonder what your thoughts are, Chima Christian. Well, this conversation precedes Simon and Namdi Kado. Um, you would recall that there was an operator called um, Demand from Uma here um, of Masob. Mm. Um, I, I, Ralph That's was a movement for the actualization of Biafra. Yes, yeah, so this conversation started pre-1957, all right, or, uh, and then moved into the war, and then shortly after the war, and then it has continued to happen. So what we're seeing is the metamorphosis of that same grievance, of that same pain. Although you would say that the manner in which the, um, they call him a charlatan, has continued to pursue this issue, um, it, it's not that which is um, um, in support of what he said his stated objective is. So I suspect that in the absence of, um, in the continued detention of Nam Bekano and then with what has happened to Simon Eba, that new operators are already on the scene. It, it's just that some of them are only known to a handful of their supporters. But then with the absence of this door now, you begin to see new voices. And what I've seen now is that if you take out one, you create two in the process. And then what has happened over the years is that... Well, that's the point Mahmoud Jaga was making. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, because there are more in the making. So although you would say that their approach is noisome, 
but there is utility in the Nigerian government sitting back to understand the grievances of the region and finding an intelligent way to solve it, despite the fact that the way uh, these uh, do have gone about it may mm. not be uh, in the best of ways. But despite those, you can still find some utility in addressing those bottom line factors. That's a good point. So let me come to you, um, Kenny Okulubo in Lagos. Do you think that with or without Mr. Epa in the picture, the wounds that he talked about will continue to fester in the southeast? Oh, yes. Uh, it's, it's, first of all, it, it will definitely be affected because he has been the head of the sit at home mantra and all because Namdi Kanu had been incarcerated. But why I, did, why I did call out the Nigerian intelligence agency is that they've not been able to infiltrate the so-called movement that uh, Simon Ekber has been able to build. If you had watched what happened in Finland a couple of months ago, you will see that people came in from Japan, people came in from America, people came in from the UK, and they were all gathered in Finland and declared him their prime minister. And these people are those who are funding the likes of the crises that are going on in the, in the southeast, the terrorist uh, strikes that are going on in the southeast, all in the name of self-determination. So you must be able to engage these people because it goes beyond. They are very well uh, educated people who believe in the cause of Simon Epa. Sorry to say, if you go on social media, if you go on Twitter, you see a lot of them there. And they are very unhappy that he's been incarcerated because over a period of time, they have not been able to be engaged. So they must do a lot to engage these people because these are Nigerians who are maybe tired of one, of the, one or two things that have happened in this country and have said that, look, it's better we'll be in Biafra. It is not enough to just hold on to the fact that you want to incarcerate Simon Ekwa or extradite Simon Ekwa to Nigeria. Now, Unam Dekanu was held for such a long time and has been held for such a long time. Has it stopped the crisis in, in the South East? It has not stopped the crisis. He said, if you release me, I'll stop the crisis. What does that mean? That means that, look, he has to be released to engage with his people. They must think of engagement at this material point in time. It cannot be by force because a lot of people still do believe in Simon Epa. As much as people like us sit down here and condemn him, there are those who are very angry that he has been held back in Finland and want to continue, just like the, the guests in the studio have also said that you might hold him and 5, 10 or 15 Simon Epas may, may rise. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. And um, we will obviously watch to see what is likely to happen next. But I think as you pointed out, Kenny and also Mahmoud Jager, um, you know, we'll just have to see whether or not extradition happens. The Nigerian defense spokesman has talked about wanting Mr. Epa to be extradited to Nigeria, but it is a Finnish investigation. And Simon Epa is a citizen of Finland. So how much that complicates the possibility of his extradition to Nigeria, we will have to wait to see. Now to our next topic. And this week, the controversy continued to rumble and fester over the appointment of the former of the lawyer and former opposition presidential spokesman Daniel Bowala as the new mouthpiece for President Tinubu. But such was the public fury that followed the appointments that within days, Mr. Bowala was redesignated and redeployed as the special advisor on policy communication, which effectively placed him outside the presidential villa and away from the orbit of influence. So has Mr. Bowala now essentially been demoted? And if so, is this likely to ameliorate Tempers. Let me come to you, Mahmoud Jaga. Um, Mr. Bwala, the former PDP Atiku Abubakar spokesman who made what many see as an about face and has now become one of Mr. Tinubu's spokesmen, drawing a lot of anger from Mr. Tinubu's supporters in particular and uh, many members of the public in general. Why do you think there's so much anger and vitriol against him? <laughs> well, <coughs> it was Senator Ali Ndume, I think, who said that in appointing Mr. Bwala to be his special advisor, President Tinubu showed that he has a large heart. Uh, normally, it is very good to have a, a large heart, but I think it usually means to forgive uh, and, uh, somebody who offended you, whether it includes rewarding uh, somebody who offended you, I think, is carrying large heart uh, a bit too far. In any case, you see, 
a president's media spokesman ideally should be preoccupied with issues about the president's own uh, public persona and uh, perception. But when you have a situation where the media advisor himself becomes the issue, and all the issue in Nigeria in the last uh, week or two has been about him, about what he said in the past, about how he made this uh, about face from one extreme end to another. Because during the campaigns last year, he said the most uh, awful things mm. about uh, candidate uh, Tinibu. Now, unfortunately, this is the age of the social media, so all the video and other records are there. So to try to say different now, mm. almost anything that Mr. Buala says, somebody will dig up a video or an audio of him or some newspaper uh, cutting where he said the opposite uh, a year or two ago, including one, I have seen people circulating one newspaper headline where he said, even if you give Tinibu 30 years in office, you will never ameliorate the problems of uh, Nigeria. Now, how do you climb back from that kind of uh, uh, statement? But I suspect uh, probably the president knows something that the rest of us uh, uh, don't know, although mm. This quick demotion, as you uh, described it, uh, also didn't look uh, very good because should have weighed everything before the appointment was made. Instead Indeed. of when the criticisms come loud and clear, the man just held a press conference and he said he's the president's spokesman. And as soon as he finished, you issue a statement in the state house and say, no, he's not the spokesman. He's now advisor on policy. Uh, something I, I mean it was it was messy mm. to be frank indeed and uh, Chima Christian a lot of those that he has pissed off if I might use that term say they are watching and assessing his tactics and waiting for him to slip up which is what Mahmoud Jaga was basically hinting at so that when he slips up they can prick the bubble of his apparent newfangled relationship with the president. Um, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, what I'm picking from this is that indeed the president can react swiftly to issues. Um, I mean, the Nigerian public and then most especially the um, President Bola Metinubu supporting uh, faction of the Nigerian public, if I might use that, um, have complained about him and then the president reacted swiftly. I would love to see the same speed applied to the coupling, uh, comment, uh, comments about the economy, especially about fuel prices, about insecurity, about other things that are troubling Nigerians. So that's what I want to see, that indeed the president can react in such a short time to a problem like this. Uh, I want to see them apply that same energy to other issues. Coming on Bala, um, people like us, uh, pardon me, we don't pay attention to people like him because their commitments you would see is not to a particular ethos. You can't see that in their line of work. You wouldn't see that commitment to a particular um, uh, view. You wouldn't see that commitment to Nigeria as it is. What I've seen is the commitment to their bank accounts and to their pockets. And whoever lines it up is who they will sing their praise. So uh, I don't see the utility in President Tenubu appointing him in the first place. However, I see also a marriage of convenience here because he possesses in his arsenal some things that I believe the president needs. Uh, the president needs now, I think he has now a lot of media communicators, even much more than he has uh, economic advisors. Uh, so I think that the president is uh, uh, indeed seeing that his approval rating in the public is not that good and he's trying to roll back some of those disadvantages using communicators. But I don't think you can communicate to Nigerians to the point that they will see that they are in pain and then you tell them that they are no longer in pain. So the best form of communication for Buhari now, uh, Tinubu now is to really get to a governance where he will address the many point points of Nigerians. Adding more communicators to his team will not really solve the problem. Well, I think the issue here as well is the fact that, um, the, I mean, it's not just about appointing communicators, it's about who you appoint as a communicator and whether or not that person is going to bring any added credibility to what you're doing or is going to detract from it. And let me come to you, Kenny Okolobo in Lagos. Um, I know you're quite international in your perspective and um, you and I have talked about the American politics quite a bit. I mean, if you look at 
what is happening in the U.S. People like J.D. Vance, I mean, he was like, there's nothing he didn't say bad about Donald Trump for a long time, and he now ends up being the vice president. Even the same thing with Marco Rubio, who's the secretary of state, who said that he was going to, he was running for re-election specifically to stop President Trump, but now he's Mr. Trump's um, Secretary of State. I mean, is, is in, in the world of politics, are there no permanent enemies? No, I think the issue uh, with this uh, particular case is J.D. Vance actually referred to Trump as, uh, as Hitler. That was in 2016. But don't forget that in 2022, J.D. Vance not only supported, stay supporting Trump, but declared for him and Trump actually endorsed him, and he won the primary in Ohio. Marco Rubio said his hands were like this during the primary. But Marco Rubio moved on to support Trump all through his presidency, and even after he left uh, the presidency, when he was at, at an all-time low. Maybe what would have happened here, from my experience, you know I was the spokesperson for the presidential campaign council for Good Luck Jonathan. I'll tell you something that we had Iman Iboro, who was the official spokesperson for President Jonathan. But we had a small team put together by uh, Urubebe and uh, Stella Odua. Urubebe was our DG, Stella Odua was the director of admin. And it was myself, Tai, and just about uh, Michael Mary, who was our DG of, of uh, strategy. We were able to change the narrative of zoning. And we were so forceful about it. But we realized that Iman Iboro had his shortcomings. But when Ruben Abati was brought in after we won the election, some of us a bit frowned. For me, I became a commissioner in Delta. A couple of others had their appointment. But Ruben Abati was brought in because of the experience he had in terms of, he, he wasn't brought in as, as a, a politician. But what Daniel Bwala should have done in this case is, he was a spokesperson of Atiku Abubakar. You cannot be the spokesperson of the opposition to Tinubu in 2023 elections. And suddenly become the spokesperson of, of uh, Tinubu, it, it, it doesn't all go well. I think Tinubu has the power to appoint and fire. And what he has done is right. He has made him the special advisor on policy, and he has taken him to the position where uh, Sunday Dari was at the Ministry of uh, Information to, to calm tempers down. People should also look at it that, like you rightly said, uh, uh, permanent interest is what exists in politics. The only thing that is constant is change. So Daniel Bala should also calm down at this point in time because he was in a hurry to say he was a spokesperson, which I also think was not right. Because why do you want to put Bayan Aluga, who has been with the president? Sunday Dari has been with the president since when he was a governor. In, in terms of, I'm mean, a communication strategist, in terms of speaking, in terms of communication, you must find those who are very close to you or who are loyal to you. There is no two ways about it. Either you're loyal to the person you're speaking for or you are not loyal to the person. And when you find that the environment is not conducive enough, it's better you withdraw or resign than continue to force yourself because you will not make a, a good spokesperson or a good communicator because people will want to listen to you. If you spend all the time cleaning your own image before you start talking about the president, then how do you send the message across? In this economy that times are so hard, inflation is at an all-time hard, right. the misery index has ever been as high as this, you know? So that is the problem we have with this okay. particular appointment. Right. We, we've got uh, about a minute and a half, uh, Mahmoud Jega, there. Um, who, why do you think Nigerian politicians have such difficulty staying away from power? I mean, most would do anything, switch sides, because, you know, you know, they, they, I mean, somebody said they would drown their mothers <laughs> if it would bring them closer to the center of power. It has been a problem in Nigerian politics. There was a fair amount of consistency in political actors' games in the First Republic, and also the Second Republic political parties were also had some ideological direction, even though there was some cross carpeting even in the Second Republic. But after that, everything went uh, haywire. Uh, since the beginning of this republic, politicians will look at which side appears to be winning, and then everybody just runs in that direction. Although, honestly, the case of Daniel Boala will probably go down on the record as one of the worst. Because, unfortunately, it's the kind of uh, situation where you test the waters with both feet. When he was spokesman for the opposition, he really carried matters to the extreme. And now he has swung to the other extreme, 
That is what is causing all this. And uh, the long and short of it is that he will not be a good uh, spokesman for the Tinubu presidency. And on that very sober note, you're watching Arise mm. Prime Time. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our assessment of the week that was here in Nigeria and around the world. Stay with us. Welcome back to Arise Prime Time, where we offer perspectives on the news and talking points of the day. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now let's continue our assessment of the week that was, and it was a week in which the House of Representatives rejected a bill seeking a single six-year term for Nigeria's president, governors and local government chairman. Introduced by the member from Imo State, Ikenga Ugochinyere, the bill also proposed the zonal rotation of presidential and governorship seats and the holding of all elections on the same day. But with Mr. Ugochinyere insisting that the struggle to make Nigeria's constitutional democracy more inclusive would continue, are we looking at months, possibly years, of slow grinding attrition over this bill? And with me to continue our examination of this issue and all the other topics that we have on the program today are Mahmoud Jega, who is an Arise News Analyst and former chairman of the editorial board of Daily Trust newspaper, Chima Christian, who is a public policy analyst and executive director of Africa's Morning Center for Public Policy and Good Governance, and from our Lagos studios, Kenny Okolubo, who is a current affairs analyst a political and communications consultant and a former commissioner in Delta State. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And let me come to you, uh, Chima Christian, because uh, we stopped at Mahmoud Jaga before we went on a break there. What are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I believe that um, Ikenga um, is right in his aspiration to uh, in impose, not, not his will now, but at least to uh, give a legislative um, outburst to that which has been uh, welling up in the hearts and in the minds of many Nigerians. Because indeed, uh, the electoral space needs to be cleaned up, and that's not just the Kenga's opinion, but the opinion of many Nigerians. However, I think that the bill so far defeats because there were a lot of things lumped up in one. Uh, for instance, you see that that bill uh, wanted to create a single term of six years for the office of the president, state governors, and then the division of Nigeria into six geopolitical zones, and provision of rotation of the president, state governor, and chairman of local governments among the inherent regions and zones, and then provide for all elections to be held same day, and then for related matters. So you see that you had a lot lumped into one, and some of these issues are controversial in nature. These are not issues you build consensus in six legislative months or one year. So, so, so what you would look, would see, uh, uh, what I expect him to do now is to go back quickly and break those laws, uh, proposals into piecemeal attempts. For instance, Nigeria has had um, a very long uh, debate on the PIB, Petroleum Industry Bill, and uh, you know that that bill uh, suffered many defeats until it was broken into pieces that you can gather consensus on. So I propose that Ikenga goes back with his team and then the, 34, the 33 other uh, sponsor, co-sponsors of that bill to break them down into sizable bits so that if a particular uh, section of the bill is not uh, 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 getting the majority support unit, they can strike that out without drowning all your efforts uh, in a pool. Again, um, the single year, six year tenure, I think I understand what they are trying to achieve. Though I don't agree with it, um, I agree that in, in, in principle that there needs to be a lot of work around Nigeria's electoral reform space. And, and I'm happy that he's leading that charge. I, I'm happy also that there are others who are leading that charge. And then he has to be seen how this leadership of the Senate and that of the House of Representatives will react to the yearnings and aspirations of Nigerians to have a clean and a fairer electoral system, beginning with our laws. And uh, Kenny Okolobo in Lagos, I wonder what your thoughts are on this, because, I mean, you have affiliations with the National Assembly at the moment, and I, I presume you keep your eye on things like this, although I think you're, you're more with the Senate than the House of Reps, but it is still the same National Assembly. Um, do, do you think that too much was packed into that bill, or, or it just was never going to fly? Well, if there were 34 of them that were sponsoring that bill, there are 360 members of the House of Rep. 
you expect they would have divided themselves into at least one person talking to seven members, not even up to ten members. And if one person is able to get seven members and you're able to convince them, then they would have been able to get it to fly. But they didn't do enough lobbying. Again, when you're talking about one single term of six years, you should be able to bring up that bill at the expiration of the second tenure of a president because the presidential office is the most important office. You're talking about the president, the governors, and the local government chairman. Don't forget that we also have offices in elections where you have governors who will not also be taking part in elections when the second tenure of the president is ending. Then you can start on a fresh slate. Where you now bring that bill, you'll be able to appeal to the conscience of your colleagues and your constituents. Because the whole idea is that people get distracted with elections. After the second year, by the third year, people are talking about primaries and they're talking about their elections and so they're not able to give out the dividends of democracy. And so you want people to be able to concentrate on the fact that I have a six-year tenure and I have to make my mark. So laudable as it sounds, but a lot of nitty-gritty are supposed to be put in to that bill. And a lot of lobbying must also be done because it doesn't stop with the House of Rep. It will eventually come to the Senate if they have to pass it as a bill. And you must also have the president's buying into that bill. It is not just enough for you to lobby the members. He has to sign it into law. You, for you to override it even after you have been able to get the bill passed, it will take two thirds of each, each house to be able to override the president. And that's also a tall order, if you ask me my opinion. Indeed. Um, uh, Mahmoud Jagger, I wonder what your reaction is to that, because, I mean, those were fairly solid points made. Yeah, not just uh, to obtain a two-thirds majority in both chambers of the National Assembly and also get the president to sign, but don't forget, you also need a majority in 24 uh, state houses of assembly before you can Indeed. amend uh, even a dot in the Constitution. But you see... More seriously, <clears throat> uh, sometimes members introduce uh, a constitutional amendment bills, you know, f maybe in order to carry favor in their own local constituency or in the media or somewhere. Otherwise, major, major constitutional issues like this will require a broad national consensus. It's just like I saw a member introducing a bill into the National Assembly to create a state. I mean, you, 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 it is very, very unlikely to, 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 to fly. If these are serious matters, the president probably should lead the discussion, involve all the major political actors and the leadership of the National Assembly and the leadership of state assemblies and the political parties. And let us agree, because it has so many ramifications. Mm. Like you're saying, if you amend the constitution and say the president has a six year tenure from when? I mean, what happens to, to, to the president wishing to have a second term? And also, you know, the four year tenure, although it has its own uh, problems within two years, you are thinking of the next election. On the other hand, it also has its benefits because it encourages patience. Mm. If, for example, people are dissatisfied with governance at the state or even at the federal level, they'll say it's okay, it's four years who will soon be voted. Six years is such a long time if things are not going on well. Yeah, it may point. need some people to take desperate measures instead of uh, yeah. waiting. Indeed. Mm. Well, let's move on to the world of international affairs. This was a week in which the U.S. and European countries diverged in their reaction to the International Criminal Court issuing an arrest warrant, warrant for the Israeli Prime Minister over alleged war crimes in Gaza. President Biden called it outrageous, but officials from the EU and several European nations issued statements standing by the court. So are we likely to see Benjamin Netanyahu arrested if he sets foot on European soil? And let me put that question to you, um, Shima Christian. The U.S. and European countries, as we said, they're diverging in their reaction to the ICC. Americans calling it outrageous. The EU, several European countries, including the U.K., saying they would stand by the court. Well, the question is, will he be arrested? The answer um, from my own where I see is no. Um, this would not be the first time. By the way, ICC, um, although it's seen as a court, but you do know that some of their activities are more, um, do I say, 
a, a means of advocacy, right? And not actually actually trying to impose their will on a particular situation. Take for instance, ICC has issued arrest warrants on, for instance, uh, 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 Putin before. But the last September, Putin was received in uh, Mongolia, which is a member state of one of the 24, 124 ICC states. And he wasn't just welcomed, he was given a state welcome. Um, you do know that South Africa now, which finds itself on the other side of the aisle, also pushing for this against Israel, when it was, I think it was Omar al-Bashir of Sudan, I believe, that was issued an uh, ICC, this same ICC, issued an, an arrest of warrant for Bashir. He visited South Africa and South Africa declined uh, to, to arrest him. So this has happened, uh, have happened a lot of times and on a number, number of occasions for me to say that um, for you to arrest such a person uh, uh, and then before he makes any tr trip, uh, whether in office or out of office, for such a president of such a country as Israel, there must have been understandings, diplomatic understanding between him and the countries that he's supposed to be visiting. So with that understanding in place, I don't expect that he will be kidnapped like Nandi Kanu, or I don't expect that he will be extraordinarily released, <laughs> like, uh, or, or he'll be given the Simon Epa treatment. Mm. So uh, what I see is that ICC has continued to say, this is where we stand on this issue. Whether or not they have the force to impose their will on the situation is what I have doubts. Serious well, doubts that was about. never what the International Criminal Court was there for. The mm -hmm. International Criminal Court depends on member countries to carry out. I mean, it just does its job, which is issue an arrest warrant. It's up to you know member countries to implement or execute that warrant. And obviously, as you mentioned, there are political considerations that take place um, from time to time. But um, it is interesting in this case, uh, Kenny Okolobo in Lagos, um, at least on the face of it, the UK is most interesting because Downing Street has indicated that Mr. Netanyahu faces arrest if he enters the UK and that the UK would fulfill its legal obligations under the ICC statute. And this is London, which is usually in agreement with virtually everything that Washington does. I mean, how does that sort of strike you? Yeah, I know eventually uh, they will have to re resign on that decision because, uh, you know, America doesn't, they are not uh, under the ICC. They don't believe in the ICC. And America has such a wonderful relationship with the UK. And just like what Biden has said, which I know Trump is also going to follow in that suit, they do not like the fact that you have declared him wanted. While we condemn what uh, has happened in, in Gaza in terms of the humanitarian crisis, people should not also forget that October 7th is still very fresh in the memory of the world, what Hamas has done. But there must be an end to this war. And so I think what the ICC should be doing at this material point in time is not to gaslight uh, either the, uh, the, the, the parties in that region but to allow a, an intervention to find a peaceful solution to the release of the hostages and an eventual uh, peace accord that will recognize this two-state two solution to this uh, situation. Even though that might be far-fetched because of the destructions that have taken place in Gaza and the fact that uh, Israel wants to take charge to, to, at, at such a time that they will be sure of their own security. But uh, this ICC uh, arrest warrant would only gaslight the region more. And America is not going to recognize it. And as long as America doesn't recognize it, it will be very impossible to implement the warrants. Like you rightly said, they would only issue an arrest warrant. They depend on the member states to actually implement it. Just like what you remember happened to Charles Taylor here, when Obasanjo was actually forced to eventually give up Charles Taylor to be tried for war crimes. OK, um, just very briefly, um, Mahmoud Jigger, um Basically, the UK is saying that it will not allow political considerations to influence its ICC obligations. Don't forget that there's a new government in Britain. It's a Labour government, which is quite different from the Conservatives that tend to toe the line every single time that America says something. Briefly, your, your thoughts. Well, you see, it is very, very important for the ICC to make a statement about what happened in Gaza because it's one of the worst atrocities that has happened anywhere in the world since the Second World Indeed. War. Indeed. You see, if you talk about provocation, 
there is no limit to it because the Israelis say they were provoked on October 7th. But Hamas could say they were provoked because Israel has been occupying their land for 60 years despite numerous United Nations resolutions. So the ICC was set up to address issues of human rights abuse and crimes against humanity of the gravest concern to the international community. That mm. is the mandate of the ICC. And there is no doubt that this one qualifies as one of the worst. So far, the ICC has issued arrest warrants against 59 persons since its formation in 1998 and since it went into effect in 2002. Most of them are Africans. 90% of them are Africans. Now, you see like the commander of the Lord's Resistance Army of Uganda, you see some militia leader in Congo, mm. even Umar Hassan al-Bashir because of what happened in Darfur. Can you compare any of those instances with what has happened in Gaza when 2.2 million people were put under siege of daily bombings and attacks and so far more than 40 people? I mean, provocation is true, but overreaction yeah. is also... And 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 an issue. And if the ICC had let this one go by, it would have completely lost the moral authority to intervene and issue one That's in any point. other case of uh, human rights abuse yeah. uh, uh, anywhere in the world. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we've just got five minutes left, so I would really implore you, gentlemen, to keep your answers to you know no more than 30, 40 seconds. Let's continue on the international trail because it was a week in which President Trump's nominee to head the U.S. Justice Department, Matt Gates, crashed and burned amid leaks from multiple investigations into sexual misconduct and drug use, his demise marking a rare setback for Mr. Trump since his election triumph. So after that cascade of controversies and pushback and with more of Mr. Trump's nominees coming across almost as shocking and beyond the pale, are we seeing a sample of what might be in store when Mr. Trump takes office in January? Very quickly, um, Chima Christian, um, do you think uh, Matt Gates jumped or was he pushed? <laughs> Well, he, he, he knows that this is America, and then uh, if you are to give, be given certain appointments, you are to expect some of these, especially when you do know that people who lost the elections are still reeling from that loss of elections. So uh, I believe that he set himself up uh, uh, for these. Those crimes are alleged to have been committed, uh, were committed as, uh, uh, by himself. And then it's just that it's coming to light uh, now that he's gotten this appointment. So yes, was he jumped or was he pushed? I think he jumped. <laughs> well, a lot of people believe he was pushed. But let me come to you, uh, Kenny O'Colliver, because this is your your territory, isn't it? I mean, you're you're a you're a big Trump fan. You haven't and congratulated me. No, no, hold, you hold you on, please. We haven't got time. On the I'm afraid we haven't got time for congratulations. <laughs> We've got about three minutes left, and I've still got to give um, Mahmoud Jagger a chance to give us the last <laughs> word on this. Matt Gates, he's just one of a long line of people that Mr. Trump has nominated who have sexual assault allegations against them. Pete Hexeth, the Secretary of Defense nominee, also has one in California, and Robert Kennedy Jr. as well. Both have denied it, but still, this is not a usual U.S. administration with these types of personalities, is it? Okay, well, uh, very quickly, Matt Gaze saw that he wasn't going to be able to get the, the votes from the senators. Don't forget that J.D. Vance and Marco Rubio are sitting senators, and it took Matt Gaze and uh, were able to try to speak to their colleagues. And they saw that even among the 53 Republicans, Matt Gaze wasn't going to get the vote. And it was the right thing he did that he decided to decline. But Hexit actually said he had a consensual sex with the lady involved, and the police didn't charge him. So I don't think that one would stop them from uh, confirming Hexit, who, uh, who fought in Iran and fought in Afghanistan. Uh, the accuser for John F. Kennedy is neither here nor there. They've not, even able, they've not been able to establish any investigation. So I think the only uh, person that would not have made it, Matt Gaze, has left. And Pam Bondi, the Attorney General of Florida, is a beautiful replacement. And so I think Donald Trump is good to go with Pam, Pam Bondi. A lot of people know that Pam Bondi is a prosecutor of 20 okay. years. And when she was the Attorney General of Florida, a whole lot... 
What yeah, is, okay. I, I'm going to have to jump in there because we're almost out of time. Um, Mahmoud Jake, just very briefly, your, your final word on, on that. Um, no president wants to see the Senate not confirm one of its nominees. I mean, that would be a black eye, wouldn't it? But you see, it was solid in the American tradition that when you nominate people for cabinet and other senior positions, they undergo rigorous FBI checks. But Trump didn't subject these people. I mean, like this attorney general that just withdrew with an open case, is filed with the police. But I'm not surprised that he nominated a man accused of sexual offenses. <laughs> it takes one to know one. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> on that note, I want to thank you all very much indeed. Mahmoud Jega is a Rise News analyst, former chairman of the editorial board of Daily Trust newspaper. Chima Christian, a public policy analyst, executive director of Africa's Morning Center for Public Policy and Good Governance. And from our Lagos studio, Kenny Okolobo, a current affairs analyst, a political and communications consultant, and a former commissioner in Delta State. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. That's it for this Friday edition of Arrive Prime Time. Join us again next week from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Lagos. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.